Prince of hosts is precious blood. How your kindness yet pursues me. How your mercy never fails me. Till the day that death shall lose me. I will sing. Oh, I will sing. Thy goodness, like a fence, by my wandering heart to be prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for Thy thoughts above. can seal it, seal it for thy courts above.
to this year's Christchurch Fashion Show. <laughs> Before I get a load of emails complaining about the new setup, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not us, um, the school has got a performance on at the moment. 39 steps, is that right? <laughs> so um, just a bit of advertising for you there. Tickets where? Tickets available. Tickets available from the school? There we go, it's on all week. So I hope you uh, managed to get along to that and enjoy it. But a warm welcome to this morning's service. Warm welcome if you're watching on the live stream as well. And of course, particularly warm welcome if it's your first time. Now, um, a bit later on, we're going to be hearing George preach for us. So I thought I'd get George up on stage to tell us a bit about himself, just in case you haven't had a chance to chat to George. So George, tell us a bit about yourself. I'm George. I'm married to Saoirse down here. Uh, we've been coming to Christchurch for about four and a half years now, and I'm an ancient historian. Historian. Maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit more about what you do in your work. So I work for a uh, place called Tyndale House, which is an evangelical biblical research center in Cambridge. Um, and I'm a historian studying um, the historical context of the Old Testament, and particular, particularly Assyria and Babylonia. Um, and I'm part of a team there that's working on a project, trying to give the church confidence that we can trust that the Old Testament is historically reliable. A lot of people say that it was all just made up centuries and centuries after it all happened. Well, if that was true, then we wouldn't expect them to be getting very little details right. So we're looking at the thousands and thousands of people's names in the Old Testament and trying to show that they fit in the historical context that they are supposed to have been in. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much, George. So what does an average week look like for you? Um, I mean, you've told us that you're looking into this historic stuff. What do you actually do when you go into work? So mainly I'm just reading through. I get given a corpus of texts to read through. Um, so I've got about 900 texts from a site called Ugarit in Syria. Um, and I'm just reading through every single one of these texts and entering any names I come across into a database. It's a 10-year project. So eventually when we've got all the names collected, we'll then be able to there do go. some analysis. So we have a Bible scholar up at the front a bit later on, which is great. Um, any encouragements you want to share with us? I know you'll, be, you'll have the floor later, but uh, anything you'd like to say? Well, there's not many scholars doing the sort of work we do, so we've been praying that there would be more evangelical scholars in this field. And a few weeks ago, we heard that a, a guy with a PhD from a very prestigious university um, became a Christian um, a few years after his PhD, and he's doing amazing work. So we had assumed we'd be praying for people to come into it from the ground roots, but then God can just convert people like that. So that's an amazing answer to prayer. That's encouraging. Thank you very much, George. Well, we'll hear more from you later. First of all, we'll uh, sing... A song, and uh, this is based on imagery from the book of Revelation we'll be looking at later, particularly this one verse. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Jesus is the lamb, of course, because he gave himself as the perfect sacrifice to take away all of our sins and failings. So let's stand and sing this song together. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. It shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my
Now let's pray together, shall we? Let's bow our hearts. We've been singing, Lord, about your unfailing love. So whatever circumstances we come here in this morning, we pray that we would keep hold of that love. Help us listen to what you have to say. Help us to obey what you have to say. And help us to praise you because you deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, notice-wise, there are a few notices on your email that you've received. If you're not on that mailing list, then come and chat to me so you get our notices email. But I just wanted to mention one thing to you, and that is the prayer gathering next Sunday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. It's a really great time. Uh, we begin with a very short talk, only five minutes or so. We sing a song, and then we have four prayer stations around the room, just a table with chairs around it. And um, at each prayer station, we pray for a different thing. So there's one prayer station for one of our mission partners. It'll be Michael Prest uh, next week. There's one for current affairs, there's one for ministry of the church, there's one for personal prayer. And after 10 minutes of praying, we all shuffle round tables so you each get to pray for different things. It's a really great atmosphere, and even if you've never been to a prayer meeting before, I think you'd find it quite an easy environment to get into. So uh, do try that out next Sunday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. at the Letchworth Free Church Hall. And one of the things we'll be praying about next week is the home group ministry of the church. Now, if you're not part of a home group, a home group is where you can make friends with people in the church. It's where you can ask all of those questions you couldn't really ask on a Sunday morning. It's where you can look at the Bible with a smaller group and have a bit more of a discussion. And some of them are also a safe space to invite friends to if you don't think they're quite ready for a church service. But they are interested. They want to hear a bit more. Some of, them, uh, some of the groups are suitable to bring friends along to as well. So if you're not part of a home group, I'm the person to come and speak to in the first instance, or one of the home group leaders, if you know who they are, and we can get that sorted out for you. Okay, now, we're going to sing again. This is a song our children know well, but it's good for all of us. It really teaches the basic message of the Christian faith, which is we are sinners and need to be saved. We can't save ourselves, but Jesus came to be our saviour. So let's stand and sing this song together, Mighty, Mighty Saviour. is good. No one is holy before God. I 
need someone to cleanse me. No one is pure. No one is righteous in your sight. I need someone to save me. But I'm so glad you died and rose again. Oh, helpless sinners like me. Please have a seat. And that song leads very nicely into the next part of the service, which is going to be us gathering around the Lord's table here, communion. So let me read you uh, what the Apostle Paul wrote about the communion table and what it means for us. This is 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is a symbolic meal for us to remember the Lord's death until he comes and to remember that it was for us. It's a meal for Christians, so if you're not quite there yet, feel no embarrassment about letting the bread and the wine pass you by. But if I could ask those who are helping me to come up to the front here and uh, start taking the bread, then I will pray for us and we'll receive the bread together. Thanks very much. So let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave your body for us when you died on the cross. You did that so that we could be saved and enjoy eternity with you. And so help us to remember this now as we take this bread together. Amen. So this bread represents the body of Christ, which was broken for us. As soon as you've received it, take it and eat it.
And now let me pray before we distribute the cup that represents Christ's blood shed for us. Lord Jesus, what a price it cost you to bring us to yourself. And so, Lord Jesus, please strengthen our love and commitment to you and to one another as we share this cup together. Amen. So the cup will be distributed. Please hold on to it, and then we'll drink it together. This represents Christ's blood shed for us. Let's drink together. And I'd like to lead you using the words of a set prayer. Let's pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give life to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, the children are going to leave us now and go out to their individual groups. And uh, perhaps as the music plays, the cups will be collected up.
ready for the next part of the service. Thank you very much for tolerating us with the different setup. It makes distributing communion that bit longer. And uh, I apologize to those who didn't receive a cup. It's not much of an expression of unity if some people in the room are left out. So I'm uh, very sorry about that. Well, we're going to continue in prayer. Oh, you okay, Dave? We're going to continue in prayer now. And can I invite Chris up to lead us? Thank you very much, Chris. And straight after the prayers, we will then sing our next song. Good morning. I'd like to start with a few words from Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteous and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host in the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars and puts the deep into storehouses. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world re revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the world that you have made and for the many things you have filled it with. Thank you for creating us in your image to enjoy the world that you have made. Thank you for all the things you bless us with. Thank you most of all for revealing yourself to us through your creation, through your word, and most of all, through sending your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to live as a man and to die on the cross as a sacrifice for our wrongdoing. You, Lord, are worthy of praise. You, Lord, are righteous. You, Lord, are loving, and you care for all that you have made. Your purposes are good. Your will and plans unstoppable and you are just, loving, and merciful. We rightfully praise your name, for you are holy. May your will be done in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, despite all that you have done for us, we confess that we have not always followed your commands or lived as we know we should. We have followed our own desires and done what seemed right or preferable in our eyes. We have sinned against you in what we have thought and in what we have said or left unsaid and what we have done or left undone. We are truly sorry for all these things and ask that you forgive us for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Help us to live closer to you in the weeks ahead and to follow you more nearly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you that we can meet here today in comfort and safety to worship and adore you. Thank you for the freedom we have to praise your name and learn more about you and your plans for us. Help us not to take these things for granted. Thank you for our homes and families, for our friends and jobs, for our health and our skills. Thank you for our faith in you 
and the sure knowledge of our salvation. Thank you that we can be sure that you have good plans for us, even when we do not know what those plans are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray for those in our church who are in need, those who are suffering due to poor health, unemployment, financial worries, or any other reasons. Comfort them in their troubles, we pray, and grant them your peace. Where there is illness, please bring healing. Where there is want, please bring sufficiency. Where there is distress, please bring comfort. Help us also to do what we can to help them and to support each other as friends who love. Lord, we pray for our church staff who work during the week to support the church and to spread the gospel in this area. Please help them in their labours and protect them from the attacks of the world, the flesh and the devil. We pray for those around us who we live near, count as friends, work with or see regularly. Help us to be good examples of Christian living and not to bring your name into disrepute. Help us to spread the gospel in the week ahead to those around us. Lord, we pray for our country and the many needs and concerns here. We acknowledge that there are many who have turned away from you and rejected you, and much in our society which is against your will. Have mercy on our country, we pray, and help us to live as strangers in a strange land that does not know you. We pray for those in government who acknowledge you as Lord. Help them to continue to work for your praise and glory. We pray for our King, Charles. Help him to be bold in his faith and to publicly profess you as Lord and Saviour. Lord, we pray for our world and its many needs. We pray for those persecuted for their faith in you in many countries. We pray for those areas where there is war and conflict. Lord, we pray for peace and an end to war. Comfort your believers in those areas and help them to be bold in their faith to those who do not know you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you. 
Please have a seat. And now we're going to turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, which if you've got one of these church Bibles, is on page 1,234. Now if you haven't heard this reading before, you might be shocked when you hear it. Just put that warning out there. But hold judgment until uh, you've heard what George has to say about it, and I'm sure it will all become clear. Isn't that right, George? (laughs) No pressure. So, Hannah, thank you very much. Okay, so Revelation chapter 2, I'm starting at verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds." Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. One second, sorry about this. The technology never works. Good job. (laughs) 
Let's pray as we start. Lord Jesus, would you help me and guide me as I um, speak this morning? And would you give us all ears to hear what you are saying to us in this passage? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a deep tension between how our culture tells us to live and how God tells us to live in the Bible. Our culture tells us to prioritise our own pleasure and happiness and comfort. Jesus tells us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Our culture tells us that our bodies don't really matter. It doesn't matter what we do with them. It doesn't matter who we do it with. It doesn't even matter if we feel we're in the right body. The Bible tells us that it really does matter what we do with our bodies. And if we're Christians, that they are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our culture tells us it doesn't matter what you believe. Everyone's on their own journey in life. So what's true for you doesn't have to be true for me. Jesus tells us that only those who believe in him will have eternal life. And that those who don't believe him face judgment and eternal damnation. Well, how then, if we're Christians here this morning, do we navigate this tension? How can we live in this culture and at the same time live as God wants us to? Well, we're not alone in having to think about these questions. Christianity has always been countercultural. And while the ways these issues manifest themselves look different today, the church in Thyatira, who um, this letter from Jesus is written to 2,000 years ago, um, were having to deal with exactly the same sorts of questions. So if we had the next slide. Here are the ruins of Thyatira today. Thyatira was a city in the Roman Empire, in modern-day Turkey, and it was a hub for skilled craftspeople, metal workers, weavers and carpenters, that sort of thing. And pretty much whatever job you did in Thyatira, if you wanted any business at all, you had to be a member of a guild, a sort of members club for people of the same trade as you. And these guilds gave you credibility as a craftsperson, and they'd be where you'd get your clients, make important connections, and they were really the social hub of the city. So it was almost impossible not to be a member of one of these guilds. But the problem was, each one of these guilds had a patron god. One of the Greek gods who they believed protected them and looked over the work and activities of the guild. And the guilds would expect their members to give offerings to these gods. And they'd hold feasts and festivals in celebration of these gods, where everyone would drink a lot and sleep around, and they'd expect their members to be in attendance. Well, how would the Christians in Thyatira navigate that tension? How would they live in that culture and at the same time live as God wanted them to? Well, in this passage, Jesus gives three pictures from the Old Testament to help the Thyatiran church and to help us today to live for him and follow him while living in the midst of a non-Christian culture. Three pictures then. The man in the fire, the woman at the window and the son on the throne. So if we have the next slide, the first picture, the man in the fire. Jesus starts his letter to this church, just as he started the other letters we've been looking at, with an awe-inspiring image of himself. So please do get your Bibles back open again if you've closed them, and look down at verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. While we know that Jesus is the Son of God, this is in fact the only time in the book of Revelation that he's called that. And this picture of Jesus, the Son of God, with eyes like blazing fire and feet like the shiniest metal you've ever seen, points us back into the Old Testament to another time when God's people lived in the midst of a culture that who didn't worship God and expected them to worship other gods. 
When God's people were in exile in Babylonia 600 years before Revelation, we learn in the Old Testament book of Daniel that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar forced everyone to bow down to a golden image of one of his gods that he'd set up. And he said that whoever didn't bow down to the image, he would throw into a blazing fire. But three men, three of God's people, refused to bow down and worship this image. And so they were dragged before the king who gave them a second chance, but they said, no, we're not bowing down to any other god but our own. And so they get thrown into the fire. And then if we have the next slide, we read this. Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? Look, he says, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. And the three men are brought out of the fire, unharmed. These three men were thrown into a fire for defiantly refusing to compromise their faith in God. And who was there with them, protecting them? One like a son of the gods. So how does this picture of Jesus in Revelation encourage us and the Thyatiran church to follow him? Well, just like the men thrown in the fire, we can be incredibly bold It would have been easy for those men to think, well, I may as well bow down to this image. I know it's not really a god. It's not worth risking my life over. But instead, they decided to face down the king of the vast Babylonian empire, prepared to be chucked into a fire. Why? Because they knew who their god was and is, the almighty god who can save them from fire. And even if he doesn't, we'll bring them through death. So they didn't fear that human king. And they know their God is with them. With them as they stand alone in a crowd of people bowing down to a false god. With them as they stand up to the king. And with them in the fire as they face what would seem to be certain death. And so the Thyatiran church could be bold, refusing to compromise on their faith. Even if it meant that they would be kicked out of their guild and lose business, they could say, well, actually, I'm not going to get involved in those pagan rituals. And for us today, we don't need to fear what our teachers or peers or colleagues or bosses or friends or even family members will do to us for standing firm on the gospel and on biblical teaching. We can say to them, look, I I love you, but I'm afraid I can't go to that pride parade with you next week. Or I'm a Christian, I'm afraid I can't follow this new company policy. Or if we're asked about a particular big topic, we can say, well, I know it's uncomfortable to hear, but actually the Bible teaches this and that's what I believe. How can we do this? The Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, is with you. And verse 19 of our passage in Revelation. He knows your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. So keep going. He's with you. Well, if the first Old Testament image is one of encouragement, the next one in our passage is a stark warning. Look down at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads servants, uh, my servants, into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Let's have the next slide, please. Thank you. While some of the Thyatiran church were persevering under the immense strain of living in their culture, they had allowed someone into their church Um, who was teaching things that were leading people away from the truth of the gospel. And this woman's teaching, we're told, had misled Jesus' servants, that is, Christians, his followers, into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. We don't know exactly what was being taught, but it could have gone something like this. Well, fire tyrants, I know you've been told that you shouldn't take part in your guild's pagan rituals, but actually, it's okay. 
Don't listen to those old-fashioned puritanical teachers in your church, and certainly not that guy Paul in the Bible. They're just out to ruin your fun. If you refuse to take part, then you could lose your job, and any popularity or status you have will be gone in an instant. And that's not what God wants for you. He wants what's best for you. And actually, sin is an old-fashioned concept. God is love. He doesn't judge you for being you. So go and get involved in those rituals. God created pleasure. So it's good to get let loose and enjoy yourself. And if he's really so loving, then why would he care if you're giving offerings to other gods? And this sort of teaching is everywhere today. Some preachers, not in our church, but some preachers will tell you that because of the forgiveness we have in Jesus, we're now free to do whatever we want. Jesus set us free from rules and laws, so go out and do whatever your body tells you you want to do. Others say, well, the Bible was written a very long time ago, when culture and morality were very different to now. Now that we've progressed, it's time for the church to move with the times. And that's something we're seeing some in the Church of England trying to do now, by trying to redefine the very clear biblical teaching on marriage. In an age in which it is increasingly uncomfortable to publicly say you're a Christian and that you hold to the teachings of the Bible, these false teachings are very attractive. They promise us an easy life and tell us that we don't have to stand out for, or, or, or be different for being a Christian. Well, this second Old Testament picture Jesus gives reveals such teachings for what they really are. In verse 20, Jesus calls the false teacher in their church Jezebel. Now, this is unlikely to be the actual name of this woman, but is instead pointing us back into the Old Testament to the the Jezebel of one and two kings, the evil wife of the idolatrous Israelite king Ahab. Jezebel, we learn in 1 Kings, was a worshipper of the false god Baal. And she had convinced her husband Ahab uh, and their children and many of the Israelites to worship Baal as well. She also killed God's prophets and tried to have Elijah, the chief of God's prophets, killed. So God had promised that she would die a gruesome and humiliating death for her defiance against him and her evil in enticing the people of Israel to worship Baal. And that's what happens. In 2 Kings 9, we read that the new king of Israel, a man called Jehu, comes out and stands outside Jezebel's house. And Jezebel stands and looks down at him. This isn't Jezebel, but from the upper story of her house through a window. And at Jehu's order, three of her servants throw her out of the window. She smashes into the ground. We're told some of her blood spatters against the wall of the house. There are some horses there that trample on her body. And when they go to bury her later that day, all they find is her skull, her hands, and her feet. Well, on the surface of it, the teaching of this woman in the Thyatiran church, and that of many we hear today, doesn't seem like a big deal. All she's advocating for, surely, is a slight compromise. Worship God and live as a normal functioning member of your culture. But Jesus is saying, no. This teaching is as bad as Baal worship. In reality, it's not a compromise any more that worshipping Baal and God is a compromise. Either we fear and worship God and trust that his ways are best, or we fear people and worship acceptance or pleasure or money, trusting that the world's ways are best. We can't do both. In reality, this teaching is designed to draw us us away from the narrow road that leads to life and onto the wide road that leads to destruction. And just as God punished Jezebel and her followers, so too will he punish all those who abandon the truth of the gospel for this teaching. Look at verses 21 to 23. 
I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, that is, those people who have gone along with what she's teaching. I will strike her children, that is, her followers, dead. He will strike them dead, cut off from God, facing judgment. Well, maybe this all sounds a bit harsh to you. Maybe this doesn't fit with the picture of Jesus that you have. But in fact, Jesus speaks of hell and judgment more than anyone else in the Bible. In Mark 9, for example, speaking of people like this woman in the passage who might lead his people astray, Jesus says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. Hell is real. And it's not something to play around with. If you realise you've been drawn in by these sorts of false teachings, then cut them out of your life. If there's a particular YouTube or TV channel or radio show or book that's claiming to be Christian and telling you these sorts of things, then stop going to them. And while this, I don't think, is an issue in our church, but it certainly was in Thyatira, if there is anyone in the church in a teaching position who holds these sorts of views, then don't let them. Stop tolerating them. Verse 20. Of course, while hell is real, Jesus has offered us a way out. Look back at verse 22. Jesus says he will strike them dead unless they repent of their ways. If God is impressing on you that this applies to you, then repent. Turn back to the Son of God with eyes like blazing fire, who searches hearts and minds, who will repay each of you according to your deeds, and he will forgive you and give you the strength you need to persevere and stand firm. Well, the first Old Testament picture gave us an encouragement the second gave us a warning, and the third gives us an incredible promise. If we have the next slide, please. Look down at verse 24 of our passage. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. There were some in the church who hadn't been convinced by the teaching of this woman. Uh, and this teaching, Jesus calls for what it really is, satanic. And to those people, Jesus doesn't require them to do anything more than just keep going. Keep going, trusting in him with their deeds, their love, their faith, their service and perseverance from verse 19. And then he gives them, and us too, this astounding promise. Look down at verse 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. Now, your Bible might have a little letter B after that quoted bit. And if you look down to the bottom of the page, you'll see that Jesus is quoting Psalm 2 here which is where we find our final Old Testament picture, the sun on the throne. So if you've got your Bibles with you, why don't you keep one finger in Revelation and turn back quickly to Psalm 2. It's on page 543 of the church Bibles. And Psalm 2 was written many hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. But in it, we get this incredible picture of Jesus, the son of God, being enthroned as the king of the universe. If you've got Psalm 2 there, look down at verse 7. This is God the Father speaking to God the Son. 
He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. And this is the bit that Jesus quotes. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Jesus, the son of God, God's promised king, has authority over the entire universe and will one day judge the world. And those who have continued in rebellion against him and have not repented, not turned to him for forgiveness, he will, just as was done to Jezebel, dash them to pieces like pottery. But if we go back to Revelation, what's so mind-bending about Jesus' promise to us here is that he's applying this psalm to us, to his followers. Jesus says that just as he received authority from his Father, so too will he give authority over the nations to those who do his will to the end. That is, until they die or Jesus returns. Just as Psalm 2 is talking about Jesus, who inherits the universe and judges the world, He's saying it also applies to us. If we're following Jesus, trusting in his death and resurrection for our forgiveness, then we are children of God. He says to us, you are my son. You are my daughter. We're his children. And we're heirs of the same inheritance that Jesus is. God's aim isn't to bring us into his new creation as groveling slaves in chains that he orders about, but to make us part of his beloved family. And somehow, when Jesus returns, he will include us in his work of judging the nations. It's a mind-bending promise, but it's one that can help us to keep going. While our culture may look like it's drifting ever further away from any sense of biblical morality, while we as Christians may feel increasingly isolated at school or work or even among our family, while standing firm and refusing to compromise for our faith in Jesus may lose us friends or jobs, or even if we were to lose our life for our faith, we can know that we are already on the side of the victor we will be standing there with him as the world is judged. So why would we want to live the way the world expects us to live? Our citizenship is in heaven, not here. And then finally, as Jesus closes this letter, he says in verse 28 that he will give us the morning star, which at the end of Revelation, he tells us is himself. He's going to give us himself. Just as the morning star, an ancient term for the planet Venus, rises above the horizon just before sunrise, Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, has risen to pave the way for us, his adopted brothers and sisters, who he will raise to live with him for all eternity. So, brothers and sisters, how do we navigate the tension between our culture and our faith? Well, we can stand firm and be bold uncompromising on the gospel, holding on to it dearly because we know the Son of God is with us. We repent of any instinct that's drawing us away into these false teachings. And we hold on to the promise that he will one day raise us to everlasting life as his brothers and sisters in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Lord, you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be with us, that we, you would give us the strength to be bold in the midst of our ever-increasingly non-Christian culture. Would you help us to repent of any ways in which we are not following you and hold on to the promise that you will raise us to life, to live with you forever.
In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we've had this quite epic picture of the sun on the throne. And now let's close with a song to remind us that the sun on the throne is also the sun who holds on to each one of us in every one of our circumstances in this coming week. So let's stand to sing together. He will hold me fast. as we stand to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before his glorious throne with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore amen please have a seat and please join us for tea and coffee after the service Young people will be meeting in the youth room after this service as well, so please follow Hannah and George through for that. Thanks very much.